is your relationship with time? Are you wired and tired, stressed and overwhelmed, busy and going nowhere, or just want to scale your business? Welcome to Take Back Time with your host, Penny Zenker. Penny focuses on books, strategies, tools, and tips to help you work smarter and approach your time more strategically. As a result, you can have more energy, focus, and get more done in less time. Be more efficient and effective. Get ready to take back time. Hello, and welcome to Take Back Time. My name is Penny Zinker, and I'm your host. And I'm excited to talk about decision-making today because I was once asked to write one chapter in a book And that chapter was supposed to encapsulate productivity. And I was like, oh my goodness, productivity is such a big topic. It's so broad. And what I came up with was the decision-making was the heart of productivity. So I'm super excited Mm. to talk about that today and how that can help us to work smarter and get better results faster. And I'm super excited to have Paul Epstein with me. He has spent nearly 15 years of his professional sports executive for multiple NFL and NBA teams. And it's a global sports agency and the NFL league office where he's broken every premium revenue metric in Super Bowl history. Oh my goodness. This guy's got some skills here and he's opened a billion dollar stadium and he's founded the San Francisco 49ers Talent Academy. And he's become known as the Y coach. And he's an award-winning keynote speaker, and he's named one of the Success Magazine's top thought leaders that gets results. And that's what we're here for, Paul, to get results. So let's talk there. You've got your book, your latest book that's been out is called Better Decisions Faster, and that's what we're going to talk about. Love it. Yeah, let's jam on all fronts, and I'm fired up to be here. Yeah. So I don't even know where to start. Your bio is so interesting from so many different... (laughs) uh, Just give us a short story of your background. Yeah, short story. I hung out for a decade and a half in the professional sports world, like you said, NFL, NBA, and specifically, it was always in a sales and business development capacity. So from an entry level to an executive level, the way I describe it is you're charged with selling the unsellable. If the building is already sold out, if every suite already has a company in it, if every single box and corporate organization in the market is already tapping into that stadium, that arena, then they don't need folks like me. They don't need the teams that I led. But when you open up billion dollar stadiums, it's about monetizing at 365. When it's about shattering records, it means, hey, we could have sold it at a certain level, but we're going to 4X this expectation year over year. And when I say selling the unsellable, you never work for the popular team in town. You always got to sell the underdog. So I'm from LA. I started at Staples Center. And people say, that's awesome. You worked for the Lakers. You were rubbing elbows with Kobe and Shaq and Jack Nicholson and the Laker girls. No, I sold the Clippers. We were the redheaded stepchild of the building. ESPN (laughs) said, you're the worst brand in sports. Then Sports Illustrated says, you're the worst franchise in sports history. And that turned out to be a very common theme Mm -hmm. of selling the unsellable of walking through fires. And yeah, there's the performance and the production and the trophies and the success and the accolades. And I call that winning the outside game. But it wasn't until I mastered my own inside game that I married those trophies with true happiness, with fulfillment, with purpose, with a sense of impact and contribution. It wasn't until a later stage of my sports career where I felt those things. And because of those wake up calls because of those inside transformations. That's why I'm no longer in sports. It's because Mm -hmm. I had to go chase my passion and my purpose and my bigger calling, but I needed every step of the journey to get me there. Right. Sometimes we forget that, that there's a reason why. And of course, when you're going through it, you don't want to hear that, that this is going to lead to something or you're going to learn something. But if we could just take a little piece of that wherever we are and realize whatever struggles we're going through, it's making us stronger. It's helping us to learn something that's going to get us somewhere that we want to go to. So for those of you out there who are struggling right now, there's going to be something that you're going to learn from this that's going to be very impactful and powerful for you. Yeah. And look, Penny, I think there's a little bit of fatigue talking about this, so I'm not going to quadruple click on this point, but I think it's an important lesson. The same insights 
that 2020 and beyond have taught us, right? Oh, no, not another COVID talk or not another pandemic talk. I'm not here to do that. But I am here to say that whether you're a person, you're a team, you're an organization, you're either better or worse than you were in 2019. You didn't stay the same. You didn't. Because if you did stay the same and people around you raise their game, that you're getting worse. And so the way I think about this is everybody's got their own version of a pandemic. We have an inner pandemic that is inside of us, right? It could be self-limiting belief. It could be a lack of confidence, a lack of belief, a lack of worth, a lack of trust in others or self. Like there's some sort of hurdle and obstacle that we always are facing. And I'm not immune from this, by the way. But what I try to do is I study how I've overcome adversity from the past mm -hmm. and I unpack. I don't go to the circumstances like I've never been through a global pandemic. So that's where the news scares you with things like, oh, it's unprecedented. That's just a fear tactic. What really was not unprecedented is how COVID made us feel. We were afraid. There was risk. There was uncertainty. Right. And we can certainly things, go back and find some of those times in our life where we hundred percent things. Absolutely. A hundred percent. So study how you overcame. When did I battle through fear? When did I successfully navigate uncertainty? Everybody has success stories, but we focus yeah. on the losses more than we focus on the wins. So I study the wins and then that helps build my confidence to say, bottle that up and apply it to the adversity of today. And now I'm more armor ready for the future. Right. right? So study the past, apply it to the present. Now you're more ready for the future. If we all took that one, two, three step, then we would be a more resilient culture. Absolutely. Well, we, we get situational amnesia, right? Because That's a great way to put it. The way that our brains work, actually, is we yeah. just delete and generalize things, right? And so at the times when we need it most, we delete all those resources and all those times that we've beat this or we've done that. So it is really important to unpack it and be present to how we've handled it in the past. So how does that come into this topic of decision making? So where does that feed in is those challenges and how we overcome them and, and how'd you come here? Yeah, well, it's a realization now. I'll reverse engineer this. I now realize that life is nothing more than a game of decisions. Mm -hmm. And if we were to audit our past, so I don't care whether we're talking career, relationships, our health, show me the quality of your decisions. I'll show you the quality of your life. Mm -hmm. Period, point blank. And nobody, Penny, nobody challenges me on that. When I say literally do an audit for better or worse, let's look at your decisions through life. And that's kind of where you land right? And so if that's the case, then it's critical. It's hyper important. The consequences are so significant. Well, so what's your process? What's your system? Like when something's important in life, we should have a process. And by the way, I am not wired to be a process guy. So let me just throw that disclaimer out. Okay. <laughs> I was in sales and we fought against process all the time. Right. And then all the numbers and all. No, I am not a process guy by nature but I've realized the power of process. Mm. When it's something that is important to you, you should have a plug in system so that it, your emotions can't take you too off kilter. When I was in the NFL and NBA, I was around the most elite athletes and high performers in the world. Those that consistently showed up because know that in the NFL and NBA, there's no shortage of gifts, talents, abilities, or skills. This is the top 0.1% in the world at what they do. But then why? Does somebody dominate one day and then they fail the next day? And it's like this endless roller coaster up and down. But some players don't ride that wave. And this all comes back to the decisions we make and the actions we take. And so when I ask people, what is your process? What is your system? Nobody has one. Oh, well, risk reward. Oh, logic and emotion. Oh, gut impulse. And I'm like, cool. So that's how you make all your big decisions. And then they kind of like hunker down a little bit because nobody wants to not have a process if something is important. So rather than vent about the problem, I exposed it and I shined a light on it. And I said, I'm going to be a part of the solution. And so the solution today looks like a book called Better Decisions Faster, speaking all over the globe about making better decisions faster and having unshakable confidence at the most critical forks in the road of life. And I'm not this raw, raw, even though I have a lot of energy and passion, as you could hear, 
I'm not here to inspire people and leave it at that because inspiration becomes a sugar high. I can inspire everybody on a stage. And if I don't give them the how to, if I don't give them the application, then on Monday morning, they go back to their inbox and then their families and distractions and kids and coworkers, and then poof. It's a sugar right high. back to the way things were. I, I hear you, man. I mean, as a keynote speaker, I do the same thing. And I think that actually also the speaking world has changed, right? People don't just want to be motivated and inspired and sure. hyped up. They want tools. They want to be able to have practical mechanisms that they can take away and put into place tomorrow that's going to make them different. And as you said, it, it can be their default, something they fall back on, something that gives them more control and more. Yep. ability to, like you said, be more resilient and have those tools available to when they need it. So tell us making decisions faster. So I guess what you're doing is, is you're sharing your decision process that you've unpacked and helping others to be more present and to use this decision-making practice. Is that right? Absolutely. And here's the problems that it solves for. If you're a leader, you're an executive, you always hear things like decision fatigue and decision overwhelm. For sure. every single person in the world, we suffer from paralysis whether by analysis or something else, we freeze, we get stuck, we're paralyzed. And this happens to be often when the stakes are highest. And so then often we get in our own heads and it leads to the worst possible decision of them all, yeah, which is in decision. We never Absolutely. make right. the call. I just want to point out there people who are listening. I'm sure that they can. I mean, if you've ever been in a place where you weren't sure if your relationship was going to work or not, indecision, whether you're going to divorce or indecision is the most stressful place there is. 100%. So yeah. We don't want to be there. We want to make those decisions faster so we can move on. So sorry. Yeah. I just, I wanted no, to no, say no, that. no. Please hop in. This is a back and forth. So look, with indecision, like you said, I think it's a silent killer because when we take no action, there can be no progress, no growth, no momentum. And even if we had a fall flat on our face, I just put that in the category of imperfect action. Those mm. that consistently win are very decisive and they're very comfortable with imperfect action because they're either going to succeed and they get the outcome that they want, or they learn, they grow, they iterate, they evolve, they adapt, they're agile. You make new like, like that decision exactly isn't forever. Right. It's a pivot point. You make a decision, you move forward, then you get more information, and then you decide do you continue to move forward or do you pivot? So it's a process, it's not a finality. It's a process. And so, yes, in a nutshell. I wrote the book to solve for the problem of paralysis and indecision and the how to. So how do we make better decisions mm -hmm. faster? It's Tell called us. the head, heart, hands equation. So think of your head as your mindset. Then think of your heart as your authenticity. So that's your truth. And then mm -hmm. think of hands as the action. Mindset, authenticity, action, head, heart, hands. Here's the equation. Head plus heart equals hands. In other words, when deciding whether to use your hands, whether deciding whether to take action or not, there's two checkpoints, head and heart. Head, do I think it's a good idea? Heart, do I feel it's a good idea? And just like when you pull up to every intersection you've ever driven through, there's a very familiar signal, green, yellow, red. And that's how we apply the head, heart, hands equation. When your head and your heart are on board, it's a green light to take action. When there's no head, no heart, neither is on board, that's a red light. We either don't do it, or if we're already doing it, we stop doing it. And then when only the head or the heart is on board, that's a yellow light. And we solve for the gap. So I wrote the book. And when I speak about better decisions faster, it's to fill our life with an abundance of green lights where our head is a hell yes, and our heart is a hell yes. So now we just take action. We're action-based, not outcome-based. That's the power of green lights. On the red side, that really, Penny, is just a matter of awareness. Because now that I've made people aware of reds, we stop running reds. Here's the challenge. A lot of mm -hmm. folks that are listening to this, and me too, we struggle with things like, man, I feel stuck, or I'm lost, or I'm exhausted, or I'm fatigued, or I'm is burned that a red out. Light? I'm not happy. I'm not fulfilled. That is not a byproduct of running one red light. That means subconsciously, we've been running red lights for months or years, mm -hmm. and we end up in this broken feeling of a place and wonder, how the hell did I get here? I'll tell you how. Subconsciously, you've been running reds. So I wrote the book to get more green, stop running red, and here is the playbook for how to navigate the messy middle of yellow. Okay. Well, where is it? 
Tell us. <laughs> We're going to be running short on time here, but sure. give us one insight into that. Like, give us a practical strategy that is in the book that we can implement right away to help us to. I got you. Yeah. Here it is. There's a good yellow and a bad yellow. Remember, a yellow is when either your head or your heart is on board. Here's the bad yellow when your head is in and your heart is out. A couple of reasons. One, sorry to break it to you, your heart's not going to change. Uh, you're not going to wake up tomorrow with a different heart. Your heart's not going to change week to week, month to month, year to year. Your heart knows the truth. Whether we want to admit it is a different story. But if this isn't the person, your heart knows. If this isn't the job, your heart knows. So we're lying to ourselves if we think our heart is going to change. And like classic example, I used to run sales teams. Okay. I had so many top producers. And you know the challenge with a lot of top salespeople, not all of them, but many, sometimes they're a little tough to deal with. Sometimes they could be a little toxic in the locker room. That's the bad yellow where you keep them because they sell a lot of widgets. Your head is in, your heart mm -hmm. says keep them, but your heart knows they're not a keeper and right. you hold on to them. And now they hurt the people to their left and right. And you wonder why you have a toxic culture because you held on to the wrong yellows. Okay. For head reasons, that yellow is more deadly than a red. Here's why a red snap your fingers. You can make the decision and cut out, but this yellow you bleed slowly because you lose right. the time that it took to eventually be like, oh my gosh, I knew I wasn't supposed to be here. I knew I wasn't supposed to be with this person. So that's the bad yellow. The right. good yellow, the opposite, heart is in. And head, there's a way to work through it. Do you need to overcome a self-limiting belief? Do you need to hire a coach, maybe a therapist? Do you need to have a courageous, challenging conversation to get it out of your own head, put it out to a trusted partner, a friend, your spouse, because the worst yellows in my life, and I, when I say worst, the deepest yellows, when I felt like I hit rock bottom, my heart knew what it wanted, but my head just kept getting in the way. And I was typically one or two conversations away from getting that pollution out of my mind. So in summary, the bad yellow is when only your head is on board because your heart's not going to change and join for the party. The good yellow is when your heart is in. My recommendation there is you stay in the fight. You try to figure out what the hurdle is from the neck up because your heart being on board is so rare. You don't want to waste those opportunities. Awesome. So just a couple of other sort of questions that I ask a lot of different people who are on the show. I think it's very interesting, the variety of different answers. So coming from the place that you come from, how do you define productivity and why? Mm. Productivity is doing more of what matters with excellence. Awesome. Well, thank you for the conciseness. And you're like, bam, yeah. drop the mic. <laughs> I mean, you, I, was, I thought you wanted like, like rattling on and on. It's awesome. No, no, I can expand. But I mean, that is my thought on productivity. And it's focusing on the essential as well. I'm a quality over quantity guy, and I know that that's true because I used to do the opposite. I used to chase too many shiny things and right. squirrel. I used to do that and say yes to everything and always have bandwidth issues. And I've recently, probably in the last year, there's been a big transformation on my side to focus on what truly matters. And so anyways, to me, that's So tell us production. how that shifted just briefly, and then we'll let people know where they can buy your book. Yeah. Well, speaking of books, it was thanks to a book called Essentialism by Greg McKeon. And oh, now yeah, he's been one of the book. endorsers of my book. And so it's uh -huh. a great, great relationship. But I read his book. It hit me at the right time, right message, right time, right place. I was ready to act on it. And I just cut out so much of wasn't, it's not that it wasn't serving me. It's just that I'm a very values-based decision maker. And my strongest value is impact. And when I consistently ask myself, am I maximizing my impact? My mm -hmm. honest answer is no. And then I ask myself, why? And it's because I was trying to do too much. So I said, where can I make my impact count? Because my definition of impact is, am I making a difference? My metric of, am I making a difference is, am I leaving people and places better than I found them? And if so, how deep and at what scale? So when I went through that process, I realized I am doing a whole lot of things that are taking up a lot of time and there's minimal impact. It's not moving the needle. It's helping, but it's not moving the needle. Right. So now I just focus on the needle moving activities. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's also, let's push back a little bit there as well. I mean, is it possible to only focus on the needle moving activities? I mean, life has some other things that need to be done. 
No, great point. So here's where I come from. Like earlier off camera, when we were just riffing back and forth, you said, we're going to focus on your zone of genius. So let me use what you said as a response to what you said. Mm -hmm. Okay. My zone of genius is not only what I do. It's when I do it because I realize that I'm an energy machine. I realize at certain times of the day, my cup feels full and I can thrive at almost anything that I do. And then at other times of the day, I just, my work is not optimal and it is what it is. So wh where I'm going with this is for me, it's going to sound crazy. I do wake up at 4 a.m. and my family gets up at 7. So from 4 to 7 a.m., I am at my peak state. I'm focused. I'm disciplined. I am optimized. And I journal the night before. Let me focus on three needle moving activities that are going to genuinely move the needle. And I'm going to do them before 7 a.m. So to your point, do I have other stuff to do in the afternoon? Sure admin and email and calls and meetings and all the stuff. But I know that the only way that I'm going to live with purpose and maximize my impact is if I crush it before 7 a.m. because that's how I'm wired. And so, yes, I agree with you that there are non-needle moving activities, but I think it matters when and where and how you do those things. And if it's in your sweet spot, then I think we're wasting an opportunity there. I'm really glad that you shared that because there is this myth, you know, people say, oh, just do the one thing. Yeah. Okay. I'm a parent. I'm a child of an aging parent that you need to take care of. And i am got my business and there's a lot of things. So I think that's really important is that you identify before the day starts, what are the needle moving things and do those first and do that yeah. at the time when you have the best energy. So I think that's important for people to hear that there are other things. It's about how you organize yourself and how prepared you are to make also to be clear on what those things are so that you can focus on the execution and not waste a lot of time trying to figure out what those are. Yeah. And exactly. And you said not waste time. I think starting the night before planning the day ahead, a hundred people told me that I never did it. I never listened. And when mm -hmm. I finally started doing it, it genuinely transformed me also in closing, because I know we'll talk about where can folks find and follow. And I want to share a free gift of a confidence quiz, but all of this comes back to something I just said. Confidence to me is nothing more than the consistently or consistency that you're acting on your values. So confidence mm -hmm. equals values times action. The multiplication is how consistently you apply it. How this ties in everything we've talked about is if you could pick one core value, literally Google a set of values, ask your five best friends to describe you in a word, come up with a process to find one word that describes you to a T and you take daily actions from cooking your favorite dinner to having a challenging conversation. It could be small, it could be big, but the people that are more consistently swinging the bat and taking action on a core value that is deeply meaningful to them, it's going to fill their cup. And when you do it consistently, your confidence rises like a dimmer switch, plus one, plus two every day. And you're just on this track to try to keep your confidence as high as possible. Fantastic. Well, tell us where people can reach you in the book and the quiz. Absolutely. So anything and everything is at paulepsteinspeaks.com. And there you'll find the confidence quiz. Literally, you'll get a score of one to 100. And then my 12 keys on how you build and sustain unshakable confidence. So that's a gift from me to your entire audience. And the book is on a little website called Amazon. You might have heard of it. So if you go to Amazon, you check out Better Decisions Faster. Right. That is literally going to be the best place. And on my website, you'll find all the bonuses. And this was just such a fun time. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and giving us really some fantastic, important tips that are going to help us to make better decisions and be better people and feel more fulfilled. I love it. Thank you so much for having me, Penny. And thank you all for being here because this is important. I like what Paul said in the beginning that look at the quality of your decisions and that's going to determine the quality of your life. And it's one decision after the next, right? And so start now. And what you've heard me talk about, my new book that's coming out, Reset Moments, make this a reset moment to step back and to look at your decision-making process, get clear on it, get some perspective, and then to realign with your practice, right? Those are the three steps of a reset moment. Step back, get perspective, and realign. And this is a perfect thing to realign around your decision-making practice so that you can start creating the kind of life that you want to live and the kind of relationships that you want to have. So my name is Penny Zinker, and this is Take Back Time. I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for listening. Today's topic is another opportunity for you to put the knowledge you learned into practice. 
Tune in again next week for more strategies that will help you have more energy and focus to get more done in less time so you can continue to take back time.